for an awesome day. Uh, it's been just a great, great day of, of learning uh, and great dialogue. And uh, uh, we're going to kind of, uh, you know, take it home right now with this uh, great panel. And so what we're going to really want to sort of end our day on is, is uh, kind of a neat discussion on really impactful cases that we've all uh, learned from uh, and kind of sharing these, uh, you know, really uh, critical cases and then just kind of having a nice dialogue. One of the things I love about this meeting is you'll see a pattern of us, you know, Damon and I and others really an answering very similar uh, questions. And so when you come to this as a colleague, you know what this expert said and what that expert said in tackling some of these same issues. So we're about to have just a, a great discussion. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Damon, Derek, and Lisa for uh, joining me. Uh, this is going to be a great, great, uh, a great time. So um, this is my, our esteemed faculty, and I want to squeeze every last minute of this discussion. So you, you guys are, you know, know very well, uh, you know, these great folks that are very dedicated and uh, to ocular surface disease and have done just great work in this area. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, this is a uh, 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 Derek's uh, disclosures, and here are uh, Damon's, my disclosures, uh, and uh, that was Lisa's disclosures earlier. So, so these are all our financial disclosures, um, and so this discussion is kind of kind of go a little bit like this. There might be some things that are going to come up, and that includes basically everything under the OSD umbrella. So anything is really fair game, and we have a slide deck, but. We don't really feel like we need to stick to any, you know, sort of uh, pre-programmed, uh, you know, game plan. And we'll just kind of, these are some of the things that might come up um, as, uh, as we kind of discuss things. Um, and, uh, but we're really, really excited about uh, different types of treatments. And, and those are things we'll be talking about. This is um, a case that I just wanted to highlight a point in, when we start this all off. This is a, a patient of mine. Um, really lovely patient, a uh, young, uh, uh, you know, female uh, patient who's really gone through quite a bit with her ocular surface disease. And she's been actually um, hospitalized uh, for uh, suicidal ideation. Um, you know, what a downer, right? What a, what a sort of a tough way to start a, a panel discussion. But my point that I want to make to you guys is that, um, you know, a lot of these folks that have really tough uh, disease, who have maybe corneal neuralgia, you've seen uh, experts all over the country have a real problem at their hands, and it can be very complex. But treating these folks or starting to treat these folks really shouldn't be. And that's one of the things that we'll, you know, kind of talk about in our panel. Um, you know, one of the foundational things that I think that we would agree on is that uh, we have two main mechanisms in ocular surface disease. There is obstruction and there's inflammation but we should be starting with some kind of treatment, even on these folks that are very complicated. Um, and so I want to, you know, uh, have uh, Derek will go ahead and, and I'm sorry, Damon uh, is gonna go ahead and, and just kind of uh, share a case uh, with us. And uh, through the presentation of this case, we're gonna get to kind of talk a lot, a lot about how we uh, approach ocular surface disease in our, clinic, in our clinics. Thanks, Ahmad. And, you know, when I try to choose a case, I try not to make it the craziest thing I've ever seen, something that's more uh, commonly seen, maybe weekly in my practice. And this is a scenario where I thought I was doing the right thing, but maybe I needed to pivot a little bit. So this is a 49-year-old white female who was referred to our clinic for an OSD eval. Our OSD vitals at Eye Surgeons of Indiana include a modified speed. Hers was abnormal. Uh, 14 out of 28, so she is in that moderate to severe range in terms of symptoms of ocular surface disease. We do osmolarity and MMP9. Her osmolarity was just off a little bit. Anything greater than eight between the two numbers is going to be abnormal. And then she did have an elevated MMP9. Those are things that are done upstream in my clinic. When we see the patient, the patient has a history of dry eye disease, MGD, rosacea. The patient's symptoms are worsening. She complains of uh, burning, fluctuating vision. She's tried other therapies. She's tried artificial tears. She was on some steroids for a while. 
poor compliance with cyclosporin. She, she had some issues with a tolerability. So she's really trying to get away from doing something that relies on topical uh, eye drops chronically, at least for her problem. She also had punctal plugs in both lower lids, no relief. Other than the rosacea, nothing else in her medical history that was uh, significant here. And at this point, she's simply using non-preserved artificial tears as needed. We wanna go ahead and see uh, another vital sign that we're gonna do in our ocular surface disease is going to be that myography image. And she just showed very minimal changes that were on her myography there. She still has pretty good architecture. It's not perfectly normal. There is a little bit of uh, tortuosity to some of those uh, glands, but not bad. Let's go ahead and look at the next slide, which is her vision is normal, 20-25 in each eye. I do like to do um, an external exam right when I walk in the room, and I also do things in natural light before we get them behind the slit lamp. I'm going to look for a cult, a nocturnal leg of thumbs with the KB light test. I'm gonna look and identify and have her take down her mask and say that she does have facial rosacea. When we get her behind the slit lamp, that's where I see that she has some anterior blepharitis, some lid margin telangiectasia, along with some conjunctival signs of ocular surface disease with injection and staining. Her tear lake is mildly decreased, but she does not have any fluorescein staining on her cornea. Uh, you'll see a video of this uh, post um, intervention, but I do like to do a very detailed meibomian gland evaluation where I'm counting the number of glands that are functional with the CORB uh, MGE device. We do that on both lower lids and assess 15 glands for the number of glands that are yielding liquid secretions, as well as what is the quality of those secretions. And in her case, it was fairly thickened. If you go to the next slide, please. So that's right. my baseline evaluation. I'm doing point of care diagnostics. I'm doing a modified questionnaire. I'm using vital dye. I'm doing a very careful evaluation of the eyelids. I'm looking for other things, co-conspirators, uh, and making sure that what I'm actually treating is dry eye MGD blepharitis because I don't want to miss something else. Uh, Lisa, Derek, does your baseline OSD evaluation look much different than that? Oh, I think you hit on all the main points there. I think, um, you know, actually, I want to touch on something that Ahmad said to, at the start. Uh, I actually think the history becomes really important uh, when you're talking about trying to identify the cause for these patients and sort of understanding what the impact is on their day-to-day -day life with the with the notion that this is something that is bothering them day in and day out that they can't get rid of. And so uh, these kinds of psychological factors play into part when we discuss um, evaluation and then diagnosis and treatment. And I think you've hit on all the main points. Uh, as far as examination goes, I usually um, make sure that I've gotten the lids, lashes, conjunctiva, cornea, and looking at the patient, like you said, before they even get into the slit lamp, because especially now with masks, it can become more difficult to identify things like rosacea and other external disease. So I'll, I'll actually have patients kind of take off their mask for a second, just so I can see to get that full picture. Yeah, I think, Damon, one of the things you, you touched on that is is the hallmark, and by the way, at a dry eye center, you know, really what we deal with is treatment failures from the community. So when people come see us, they've typically tried a bunch of stuff and had limited success. And that that comes into, and you're going to see these in primary practice too, when you, when you have people coming into you from, you know, uh, other colleagues or just failed treatments. Part of the, the barrier now is re-educating on them into a couple of ideas is number one, what they did in the past just may not have been done in the correct order or sequence. And secondarily, this concept that, you know, what they're experiencing could be more significant than just symptoms. It could be vision and all these other things as well. I, I like everything you did there. We're pretty much the same. The only other thing that I'll do before I ever walk into the room is I always look at the topography. We do topographies on everyone. And for me, topography gives me a lot of vital information before I walk in the room, just based on the quality of topography and maybe where the, the asymmetries are in the topography gives me a good idea of what I'm dealing with. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, and we can, we can sometimes, 
you know, if, if we're not really having the patient, and I, I find epithelial basement membrane dystrophy a little bit more superiorly, but if we're not really looking carefully, sometimes we can miss that at the slit lamp, and that's another way to pick it up with this, you know, if you find this irregular stigmatism on topography. Um, how about how about mybography? Do you guys think that's essential if, um, you know, if a patient's referred to you, uh, like in this case, uh, you know, uh, from a colleague, is your basic workup, does it include mybography? Um, uh, Lisa? I think my biography is very helpful. I will tell you that personally, I've been waiting for that next generation of ILEX to incorporate that into my practice. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think, uh, because I do think you can get a lot from the evaluation of the meibomian glands um, just at the slit lamp and with some of the things that um, Damon had mentioned, but I th it is helpful to visualize the glands. And so if you have the opportunity to do so, especially if you are dealing with more advanced dry eye patients, we're trying to determine what the cause may be, because I think that's something that's really important too. I've started using tear osmolarity to help rule out when patients aren't necessarily dry eye, but could be one of the other things in the differential diagnosis of dry eye, like an allergic conjunctivitis, like contact lens overwear, et cetera, that may have dry eye features, but that need to be treated with that. So uh, I do think that my biography is helpful. Uh, and there are other things that should be done to make sure that your, um, your differential diagnosis is broad enough uh, that you're getting to, to the right treatment. So let's look at what I did for this patient that has some recalcitrant mm -hmm. disease. Uh, I really want to understand, you know, sometimes I'll have the patient kind of walk me through their day and how do their eyes feel first thing in the morning? What are, what's their regimen? And I can sometimes pick up on some subtle clues as to what is going to be the best treatment approach. In this case, I, I always want to make sure that we are on the same page, that our treatment goals uh, are going to be aligned because if my goals are different than the patient's goals, we're going to have a little bit of an issue there. So we've uh, kind of broken it down in her case. Clearly, we want to reduce her inflammation. We saw that she has conjunctival injection uh, as well as uh, having signs on her ocular surface and elevated MMP9 level. We know that if we are going to be addressing dry eye disease, inflammation is going to be a critical part of that. We want to improve symptoms. She's also interested in improving her uh, skin appearance with the rosacea. We know looking at her myelin quality, that's pretty poor. So all of these things, we want to improve both the inflammation and the health of her glands. Hopefully that's going to give her some symptomatic relief. And then importantly, in her case, she does want to stay away from eye drops. She's failed those in the past. And like Derek said, I think really good point is sometimes we're not doing things in the right order. And maybe we needed to do things a little bit differently here for this patient before they would be successful with the topical immunomodulator or other therapies that are out there. So what we agreed to do is add an omega fatty supplement uh, uh, to her regimen. We agreed that we were gonna do four sessions of IPL. Uh, I will do those typically two to four weeks apart. And then at session four, we were gonna do micro exfoliation followed by thermal pulsation. In this case, we chose to, to do an ILUX for this particular patient. This is not the actual patient. This is one of my staff members, but this is doing IPL in my clinic. So that's my initial treatment plan. But I, you know, maybe want to throw it over again to Lisa and Derek is, in terms of her goals, our therapeutic goals to address her underlying disease, would you do anything different here right from the jump? I think if she, it depends how bad her rosacea is, uh, but if the rosacea certainly can be playing a part in the um, blepharitis and the mybum secretion there um, and in her overall symptoms. So I would consider um, an oral treatment like a doxycycline for the, um, for the rosacea. Yeah, one of the other things we found in, when we first actually, uh, you know, we're developing the FDA study for IPL here in the US, is that the patients that, and I, we, we could not include these in the FDA study that was done for the menace, but the patients that were on an anti-inflammatory beforehand, uh, shortly beforehand, and, and we kept, or we continued one post-treatment did a lot better than the ones that did not. Now we couldn't do that in the study simply because it was a variable that we couldn't control for. So, 
you know, that's the other thing is, it's a great point. You want, this is an inflammatory disease that primarily is hormonal based and is more akin or related to skin disease than it is to a specific eye problem or an eye disease. It's just, it's happening in the eye. So, because remember your, 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 my bovine glands are subtle derivatives of your sebaceous glands, but they're really controlled by the same hormones. So I, I think that's a great point. You want to reduce inflammation as much as possible. And we do this with every lid clearance device and system we have, as well as the IPLs or anything along that line, we find that if you aggressively treat inflammation beforehand, the treatment is far more effective. Yeah, and also any type of treatment you do, whether it's IPL or lid clearance devices, it's going to instigate inflammation to a certain level. And, and in post op or post-treatment anti-inflammatory therapies really help the success rate quite a bit in our experience. Damon, I love the way that you frame that, that, you know, you, that this patient is coming into you saying, I don't really want to do any eye drops. And, and I see that all the time in my clinical yeah. practices, patients will be referred and they'll say, I've tried this and this and this and this, and those don't work. So I want something else. And that's a red flag sign that just like you were saying, maybe that, you know, sort of the treatment plan wasn't in the right order, or there wasn't, it wasn't comprehensive enough, or it wasn't, uh, you know, something that the patient kind of, uh, you know, stuck with for long enough to get that improvement. Ahmad, I want to jump in with one quick thing, though. One of the things that Damon did here that I think is far more advanced than most people do, and probably most people don't understand unless they're doing a lot of this stuff, is that a lot of these treatments aren't mutually exclusive. They're, they're very much synergistic and beneficial. So in the last line here, he actually says microblepharic exfoliation and then thermal pulsation. The critical thing about the IPL studies that were done is we didn't we weren't allowed to scrape the eyelids beforehand, so there was a very limited effect as far as what what we got. And then second of all, IPL by itself does not heat the meibomian glands at all. It actually, it doesn't even touch the meibomian glands as far, as far as both studies that were done here in the U.S. So the thermal pulsation could be very beneficial for heating up the gland, and, and then whether you're doing a tear care or an Ilux or or, or, or you know tear science. Uh, st type stuff and then evacuating the gland itself. So again, these are not, these are not competing therapies in many ways. A lot of times they're synergistic therapies. So I, Ahmad, were you going to say something else before I jump in? <laughs> I was going to ask you what, what that looks like in your clinic, actually. Do you do um, IPL uh, and then have the patient back uh, you know, for their next IPL, or do you do IPL and thermal pulsation on the same visit? How does that, how do you stage those? Okay, before I answer that, I'm going to go back to two points that were made that I think are really important. Uh, one that I do think it's a delicate conversation when you want to tell patients that something previously wasn't done in the correct sequence or, you know, um, that you want to try something that they did before. And I think it's really important to help explain to them for the educational purpose that, uh, you know, we see more inflammation right now. So yes, I know you've tried this before and it may have not worked the way we expected, but we're going to do this in a different order that's addressing the inflammation that you're showing now. So to kind of give the patients confidence that you are, you know, you have a treatment plan here in place for their condition at the same time, you're not throwing the previous doctors under the bus. So I think that's a really important point. Uh, I do think that reducing the inflammation, and I know Damon, you did a study on this too, um, utilizing steroids um, in conjunction with um, thermal pulsation. Um, we're analyzing the data now, but uh, I did a study where we used Dextenza in conjunction with Ilux. Uh, because we know that there is a lot of inflammation prior, and then there's a lot of inflammation created when you do these types of procedures. So I think to have the best results and to have your patients comfortable while the inflammation settles down again, um, putting them on anti-inflammatory therapy includes um, uh, uh, not only a doxycycline, but also a steroid component or can include a steroid component as well. Um, and so to your question on IPL, uh, I do not do IPL currently, um, but I do obviously I do thermal pulsation. And um, that's something that I've employed quite frequently in patients who I do find that they have um, poor meibomian gland secretion. Uh, they have had tried multiple therapies that are insufficient. Uh, and, you know, that I feel there's 
at least, I mean, if you look at the data, it's anywhere from 60 to 80 plus percent of patients have, who have dry eye have some type of meibomian gland dysfunction. So I, I do think you need to, um, that needs to be something that you're addressing as well. Yeah, Lisa, the study that uh, you alluded to is uh, we actually did Lipiflow plus Dextenza, right. and the results were very favorable for both signs and symptoms when we added those two uh, treatments combined versus just doing the Lipiflow alone. Yes. And interestingly, I, I did not have the results of that study before we treated this patient. So that is a little bit different. Ah. <laughs> you know, we, we always continue to evolve, right? As right. I, I look at this case, and this is from about a year ago. And even, you know, looking back at a year ago, I would have treated this patient differently now because we continue to learn more and more about what actually works and what's the most effective right. combination for these patients. Um, and I think you can convey I, that to the patient too, as you, as you, especially with these more complex patients that have seen multiple providers, or, you know, are coming into you for the second, third opinion. I think that message is really important to share with our patients. What's, what's the, what's the anti-inflammatory, what's the duration of the anti-inflammatory effect with Dextenza? So it's uh, 30 days. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, so it's, it works really nicely because it elutes in a taper, in a tapered fashion. And so you get most of the, uh, drug, most of the dexamethasone in the first, um, couple weeks and then or actually in the first week. And then if, um, you'll see the curve, uh, kind of slowly go down. So in addition, it provides some punctal occlusion, uh, which um, obviously also can help uh, with these types of patients too. And for right now in the U.S., Dexans is going to be indicated for use uh, at the time of any sort of ocular surgery to reduce inflammation. It's also recently approved for ocular allergy, but it's not approved for true keratoconjunctivitis sicca or MGD or dry eye at this moment in time. But certainly there's things that will continue to develop there. So I see this patient back. This is now two to three months after initial visit. I thought we were on the right path. You know, we're going to treat pretty aggressively in office, add the omega supplements, avoid other prescription medications. And now we're not much better. We've got a speed score of 12 out of 28. So symptomatically, she's about the same. Osmolarity is in the, the normal range. That was very similar to what it was prior to our intervention. A little bit of reduction in MMP9, which is what I would expect with IPL. I, I do see improvement in inflammatory after we do that treatment. But again, our history, only mild improvement in symptoms. Facial rosacea has improved. That was a positive. And she has been faithful with what I've asked her to do. If we go to the next slide, I think that this is where I have evolved over time is, you know, I used to just use this MGE evaluator and look at how many glands are actually secreting oil. I'm going pretty quick here. Usually you want to go five to 10 sec seconds per section, but I'm actually counting the number of glands that are secreting liquid. And there's a little bit of secretion that's coming from a lot of those glands. And it looks to be not in that bad of shape. You may have noticed that her eyelid flipped a little bit there. That's another clue is, am I missing lid laxity maybe as part of her problem? But you can see here now when I actually press harder on her meibomian glands, this is with an oculus lid stick. And you see the quality of those oils despite four IPL treatments you can tell that we've got some work to do here. So that is how I'm doing my baseline diagnostic expression now as I use that MGE tool. Again, I went pretty quick there and then I'm pressing harder and you can do that with a variety of instruments, the Mastrata paddle. Uh, I, I'm using this lid stick because I don't want to miss those cases where, boy, it looks like there's actually good secretion. I look a little bit deeper and I see that her mybum is pretty lousy. Derek, uh, Lisa, comments on that? Yeah, I agree. With time, actually, what we found is, you know, initially we're using Lipiflow first before we do IPL because we feel like you have to evacuate the gland before you can stimulate it with IPL. So two totally different concepts, uh, right? I haven't done IPL. I mean, I haven't done Lipiflow in a couple of years. We've almost completely switched over to something called tear care. Uh, and the reason why we like that one is it does not apply any heat or compression to the lid margin itself. And that's what I want to avoid because of the rosacea and plunge stage on the lid margin. 
uh, it's same kind of concept is I think you have to evacuate the obstruction before you can get any benefits from like IPL. You do get a benefit, I think, long term with doxycycline, but you got to remember if you're going to use doxycycline, you're in it for the long haul. Studies have shown that it can take three, six months to get a substantial change from doxycycline use. And, and so the other thing too is a, a long term kind of immunomodulators can sometimes be helpful. And and if you explain to a patient, kind of like we had discussed before, that you know maybe now that the inflammation threshold has been brought down some, maybe some of these previous treatments will have a better chance of working these chronic treatments. And then the last thing we'll do with absolutely every one of these patients that has any lid margin disease at all is use some type of hypochlorous acid. We think that's been so beneficial. It's almost a kind of a mainstay with almost every single patient in our clinic. And Damon, I don't know if I missed it, but is she doing um, like warm compresses or using a brooder mask or something like that at home regularly? She is pretty motivated to not have to do very much. So this is one of these <laughs> situations where it is a challenge, right? And you have to yeah. have this conversation. And boy, yeah, I would have liked her to do two or three more things from the start, mm -hmm. but that just wasn't going to happen. She was frustrated. Hey, let's do what I can. What I try to set up for these patients is, this is the next step. This is what I think is the most reasonable thing to do to try to help your situation now. We may have to layer some things in on the next side of this, you know, two or three months down the road, but let's start here because I definitely need to address the lid inflammation and the obstruction. And there's some patients that you can do eight, 10 different things and they're going to follow it to a T. She was not one of those patients. So I wanted to at least get some sort of, um, you know, long-term uh, nutritional supplement to help treat inflammation from the inside out. She was already comfortable using teardrops. You can see that just based on what we're seeing here, we've had an incomplete treatment response. Clearly, you know, she still has inflammation and we've not met our goals. You know, have we reduced inflammation? Certainly not enough. Have we improved symptoms? Really not at all. My quality, not so great. We did improve her skin appearance. So Looking at, um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide because I think that's where the conversation gets really interesting is what is it that we're going to actually do as a next step or maybe in retrospect, what should I have done right from the beginning maybe to alter the course of this patient's uh, journey? So things that are considerations, at least at the time uh, when I saw this patient, there's a few new things that maybe we want to consider that have been recently introduced to the market, but dietary modification, oral or topical antibiotics, topical immunomodulators, topical steroids, autologous serum, and then certainly as a next step here is maybe some additional in-office therapy. So Derek, when you look at what I've done and how the patients responded or not responded, what do you think is the, the next couple things that you want to do here? And you added the hypochlorous acid. Again, this is not a complete list. There's probably at the whole right side, we could add what else can we do here for this patient? But this is something that um, when you look here, in addition to what you see on the screen, are there other things that you would say as a next step for this patient to try to help them? Yeah, I think it's important to also address the idea of uh, so many, I uh, think, docs are really afraid to jump into these kind of interventional dry eye treatments because they're afraid of failure. But, you know, it's interesting if you contrast this with the millions of people we've given Restasis to, and if you look at the clinical study, only 10% of Restasis patients had an increase in Shermers that was statistically significant. Uh, you know, we don't really feel bad about throwing Restasis at people for the last 20 years knowing it had, you know, at least a 10% chance of increasing, um, you know, Shermer's 10 millimeters. And now I know it has other benefits as well, but uh, you know, you gotta think, you may have had some success here in certain areas and they may just not be sy sy symptomatic. And, and so I think like Lisa said, doxycycline is a great one that we'll use when we have some multiple treatment failures. Uh, you can alter nutritional stuff. One, hypochlorous acid is big. I always circle back around, get more aggressive with the anti-inflammatory stuff. Uh, I do like them on a long-term immunomodulator if they've not responded to multiple treatments. It just helps other things work better, as crazy as that sounds. And, you know, the last thing too is getting much more aggressive with my lid evacuation devices. Um, you know, and in a case like this, sometimes I'll do two, three tear cares 
um, you know, over a span of several months before I feel that they're in a state that I can start then stimulating and helping modulate the glands as opposed to just constantly worrying about evacuating them. Uh, and, and there's there's other studies too with lid device lid clearance devices that have showed somewhat similar you know data that you know it's not just one every six months or once a year some people and this is the variability that you have in the human population will need it a lot more and more aggressively and this is good for people who aren't as motivated to do tr home treatments that you know you have something that's a little more aggressive in office that can help them. So a couple of things I would mention, I think those are all, I agree with um, everything uh, Derek just said. Uh, I think that the um, topical steroids, I know in the past, uh, they are, you know, there's one of those things that we, we know that they're effective to help for anti-inflammatory, but there's always some hesitation or there has been hesitation because there hasn't been anything on label. And there is always the fear of increased pressure. So for me, the advent of Isuvis for that has been huge uh, because I have put patients even with glaucoma on Isuvis and um, had them do it for the four times a day for two weeks. Uh, and not had their pressure go up. Uh, and so it's from the way that it's formulated and from its, the way that it stays more on the surface. I think that's a great tool that I've added that I think is helpful. There are studies also that show with the topical immunomodulators with um, lafitograst and with restasis that there is actually some improvement with meibomian gland dysfunction when you have uh, those on board. I don't know that the uh, mechanism is entirely understood, but it's postulated that reduction of the inflammation may allow the glands, uh, even in the lids, to perform better. Um, I absolutely think the doxycycline, especially for somebody that has signs of facial rosacea as well as ocular rosacea, is really effective. Uh, just two bits of warning with oral uh, doxycycline is the upset stomach that they can get. So I usually tell them to take it with food, but not things like milk. It's all usually all written on the label, but I'll give them a warning about that ahead of time. Uh, and then also the sun sensitivity. So um, to Derek's point, you do have to be aware of that and let the patient know that this is, um, this is more of a chronic treatment, kind of like their chronic dry eye. Uh, and then on the evacuation of the glands, uh, I do think it's important when you can to encourage the patients to do, like you said, Damon, there's only that we can recommend sometimes there's only so much that they're willing to do. And we sort of have to take that in, into consideration with the treatment protocol. I do think the help with the at home treatments in between the in office therapies do make a difference. Um, and I've actually, I'm evaluating the Turkey device now, but I definitely like, and I'm sorry if there's an official name for this, I don't know what it is, but the, um, the forceps with the tear care device are actually my favorite to do the meibomian gland uh, evacuation. So I really like, Damon, how you did that. I, I do think that's more effective sometimes to see what the secretions actually look like. And I found that that, uh, that forcep is really effective. Yeah, so that's the clearance assistant with tear care. And, you know, looking at this and thinking about this and, again, aligning the patient's goals with what I think we need to do, this is where topical steroids for me for a several week period of time is going to make sense. Uh, I'm going to offer additional in-office treatment, a couple more IPLs. I did then recommend a tear care, a little bit more aggressive expression to really clear out those glands. Um, and, you know, we got those glands moving with the ILUX, but it just wasn't enough in this case. So I think that additional in-office treatment, asking her to do a little bit of a, a course of drops for just a few weeks. And I think it's reasonable then to say, hey, we really are going to have to do more than what I can just do in the office if we really want to have a successful result here. So the points with hypochlorous acid, warm compress, et cetera, I think all of those are very valid but there's just a lot of different elements. And again, this is a case that is pretty routine in a clinic like ours. And how we address this is a, from a very individualized plan, because there is not a cookie cutter approach to this when you have these patients that have moderate to severe disease and they're recalcitrant to other treatments. Um, would you Emily, any other thoughts here? I, I was just gonna say, you know, also now speaking of newer treatments, 
um, with somebody like this who doesn't like drops or doesn't want more drops, um, do you think she would be open to a nasal spray like Tervaya? Mm -hmm. I think that would be the step after I address the inf inflammation mm -hmm. a little sure. bit more. Is I and again, that's from this case a year ago. These were some of the things that I was doing routinely. And again, we've left some of the at home stuff off because she's not been really good about doing those things. So possible next steps for me now, I think once we get that mybum flowing better and we reduce that inflammatory load to really improve her, you know, tear production and hopefully get that homeostasis to be back in line. Uh, I do think that tier via would be a reasonable after this additional step of some office work and anti-inflammatory therapy. Awesome. I think we, I pretty much, we hit a lot of these, these questions we already covered. Um, very great, you know, great discussion, uh, you know, uh, important case. Um, and uh, so Dr. Uh, Nijam is going to now uh, share her case. Thanks so much. So this is uh, this is not so much of a routine case, but it is something that I'm sure we'll all see. And uh, just to make sure that uh, we keep all the causes of dry eye in the back of our mind. So this was a 52 year old female that had severe dry eyes in both eyes for over a year. Uh, she had all those symptoms uh, that they come in with: dry eyes, dry mouth, redness, irritation, foreign body sensation, sandy, gritty. I mean, she was just, she was miserable. And in fact, uh, her job required her to work on three computer screens all day. So she, that wasn't helping her either. Uh, she said that it affected her ability to drive at times. She was actually thinking of quitting her job. That's how bad her symptoms were and how much, I mean, she's a, she's a young woman, she was only 52, but that is how bothered she was by the severity of her symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. Her rheumatoid factor was positive. Uh, they had done testing at outside uh, facility before referring her in, uh, but her Sjogren's testing was negative. She was using artificial tears every two hours, um, as well as gel. Uh, the gel helped, but she complained that it blurred her vision. And she had been tried on lafitograst and cyclosporin 0.05% uh, and had no improvement. Um, so that was a picture of her initial um, examination. Uh, and then uh, these are just some photos uh, to let you know. Um, that's what her ocular surface looked like. Um, she did have injection on both eyes, um, just kind of those, you know, dilated angry vessels. She had elevated osmolarity at 327 and 331, and she had a positive MMP9. So um, I just wanted to discuss with the panel, um, what would your differential be at that point? What would your approach to treatment right now? Um, just some initial thoughts, um, given this lady is coming in and is really at her wit's end. Um, and she's got positive tests. So we know that she's got inflammation and she's got a lot of symptoms. Yeah, this is a great, great way to start kind of, you know, the clinical picture there when she's, you know, looking off in, in uh, different positions of gaze and, and in primary gaze, doesn't look like it's a, you know, sort of a horrible case of ocular surface disease, but these diagnostics can really help you understand that uh, there is some inflammation there. So with those numbers, it certainly makes sense to kind of the same as we kind of were discussing in the last case. For me, I typically would start them on something like Isuvis and uh, an immunomodulator type of uh, drop, knowing that we're going to be off of the steroid in a few weeks, but um, you know, continue using some kind of an uh, anti-inflammatory medication ongoing after that until we, you know, maybe uh, have them back and see how they're responding to that. Yeah, sure. Derek, what do you think about anything else? Yeah, man, I'm from Texas, man. We love our steroids and we go a lot harder than that. You know, if someone comes in here like that, I ain't pussyfooting around. Um, you know, I'm going to probably hit them a lot harder. This patient has significant discomfort in their quality of life. And so yeah. I think probably what I see from the community-based docs is, is maybe not aggressive enough. I love Isuvis. A ton of my patients have it as an at-home therapy to dose at, you know, as needed, as long as they're an established patient. And I've, I've figured out they're not a steroid responder. But, you know, in a, in a case like this, this is, someone, this is someone that's seeking me out. So 
the two things that I'm going to tell this person right away, and I tell this almost to everyone in the dry eye clinic, is my first goal is to make you feel better in the dry eye clinic. And then my second goal is to reduce the burden that this disease has on your life. And that includes eventually reducing the amount of tears or drops you have to use. But in order to get there, we're probably going to be heavily dependent on drops, at least initially, so I can get you to a spot. By the way, that last picture that you had with uh, the two eyes turned in, that that hurt my brain to look at. It looks like the patient was cross-eyed and real. oh my gosh, that's a terrible picture. Uh, I know what you're getting at, but doesn't that look like, oh, it's so painful? Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally with you here. I think the other thing that I do is I tell all dry eye patients this, their disease, when they ask me, can I fix their disease? I say, no, no one can. You're always going to have dry eye. Yeah. My job is just to basically reduce it to a point like arthritis that the time between flares is as long as it can be and that your life feels better. So if someone comes on with any connective tissue disorders or rheumatological disease, I tell them that they're going to be a little bit of a harder case. It's going to take us a little bit more time to figure out if the medications or the therapies are working or it's just the fluctuation in their systemic inflammation. Uh, and then from there, the, all these tests are really, really valuable, uh, you know, for really adjusting and figuring out a kind of where to start kind of idea, because we don't want to shotgun things like everyone else has in the past. And, and you're exactly right. You have some patients that come in, they're almost all a failure on a cyclosporinophytograst, but a lot of times you have to reduce the inflammation to a point that it's cyclosporinophytograst can at least then work. Um, you know, and, and in these tests, I love tear osmolarity. I'm not going to do any test that looks like a pregnancy test because I have four kids and I have PST, <laughs> PTSD from that. So, uh, you know, the concept here, I think, is very sound in that someone comes in, they failed multiple therapies. What are you going to do different? And what are you going to do? And, and like Lisa said, how can you educate the patient that you're going to do something that's a little bit more directed at what their root cause is, as opposed to just randomly treating symptoms? Exactly. Damon, take, take us home here. <laughs> yeah, so looking at things, this is obviously the missing piece is just what those uh, elements of abnormal point of care diagnostics with the osmolarity being high, MMP being high, a combination of topical steroids and a topical immunomodulator, and then a little bit more investigation. And I think this is easy for me is, well, clearly, maybe we're missing something here. And, you know, thinking back to case one is, what am I missing here? Was there some other elements that I need to address? And part of our initial workup is we're going to make sure that we're not missing something. I'm going to pull on the lids. I'm going to look for lid laxity. I'm going to have the patient look down. I'm going to look for evidence of collarettes related to demodex blepharitis. I'm going to pull the upper lid up. And we're going to see something like this is, wow, what happened here? All of these tests are abnormal in terms of their point of care. Their clinical exam maybe was incomplete. And now we have a little bit clearer picture that this is something beyond traditional dry eye. Uh, we're, we're seeing signs of uh, inflammation of the superior conjunctiva. This would be consistent with SLK that may be associated with dry eye. Clearly dry eye is part of her uh, diagnostic or her um, clinical impression at this point. Yes. But this is the missing piece here is we looked a little bit harder and we found that clearly we need to do something more because it's not just dry eye, it's dry eye plus SLK in this particular situation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Those straightened vessels um, that you see on the superior conjunctiva that really, you know, you only are going to observe if you lift that lid and have the patient look down. And so to your point initially, Damon, uh, that thorough exam and making sure that you've, uh, you know, you've checked all cardinal positions of gaze uh, is key uh, because I do think that's was the missing key that had her go on for a year with some of these treatments um, that didn't, uh, you know, didn't address the underlying cause. Uh, and uh, likewise, also inverting the lid. And uh, like you said, making sure that you're looking carefully at the lashes. 
Uh, Liz Yu gave a great um, explanation to look for demodex blepharitis is really just to have them look down and look at the lashes when they're looking down. It takes about two seconds, but you would be amazed when you start doing that. I've been amazed at how many demodex blepharitis that I've noted now that I didn't see in the past. So I think that's incredibly important. Um, the hallmark or the, the thing that you want to remember with SLK is make sure you check for thyroid. Um, that's really important with these patients. They have a high association of thyroid disease that often goes undiagnosed. Um, this was a few years ago. So in this case, I did uh, put the patient on lodopredinol 0.25% and cyclosporin uh, 0.09%. And just two weeks later, you can see the photos on the right, um, just how much difference it made. And I definitely think that using NISUVIS um, to induce therapy is really important uh, to get the lifidograst and cyclosporin, you know, restasis, sequa, et cetera, to give them a chance to work properly. Uh, you really need that steroid induction. Um, and then now I would also consider Cherbaya in a patient like this too. Oh, and that, that was the front of her eye that scared Derek. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much <laughs> awesome awesome two great cases you guys um i'm going to um you know go through a, a case uh, rather quickly here um you know this is a, a you know a, a case uh, a little bit more involved basically a patient that has um severe ocular surface disease and glaucoma uh, uh, simultaneously. And this is a uh, Stevens Johnson's uh, patient in one eye. I saw this patient urgently uh, in clinic in one eye. He is uh, NLP and then he's a 52 year old patient. So young, young patient. And he's had a history of uh, really high pressures, um, has had in that, in that NLP eye, had multiple procedures. Um, and uh, he's got a corneal scar um, in his, uh, you know, in, in his, uh, uh, in his left eye. And just two main things with Stevens-Johnson syndrome, we don't want to prescribe doxycycline for these patients. And there's a note in the chart, these, these patients tend to be super sensitive on medications that we might be using pretty frequently with other patients. She's had an, uh, an allergic reaction with, uh, to Alrex in the past. So those are the, you know, kind of a, a super quick summary of his pertinent history. I always try to think about, you know, the, the, the eye that ended up being NLP, you know, in these cases, I always try to figure out how can we make sure we don't get into a situation where we have the, the same thing happening in the other eye. So you had uh, keratolimbal limbo uh, allograft, limbo stem cell deficiency, penetrating corneoplasty, chronic angle closure, and had to have uh, uh, CPC. That was the course that led up to uh, him being NLP in one eye. And as you know, these, these folks will have a uh, simblepharon and you can see this lid margin here, just a really thickened lid margin, a lot of keratinization of the lid margin. And so with Stevens Johnson's is uh, Bita Asghari gave a great lecture yesterday on, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, features of these uh, patients with uh, Stevens Johnson. So, so this is the, you know, kind of a quick picture. We talked earlier uh, about, you know, what are the pertinent things we see in our clinical examination? One of the things that Don Korb really taught me is to pay attention to this junction between the skin side of the lid and the cutaneous side of the lid margin. And if you see those meibomian gland orifices really drawn posterior to that line of marks, that's an indication that that patient has pretty advanced meibomian gland changes, cicatricial meibomian gland dysfunction. So this is a patient that uh, has uh, glaucoma, uh, and his, his visual acuity and his, and his one uh, functioning eye has been steadily going down and he's on, he needs to be on, on glaucoma medications. And we know that, you know, in general, uh, you know, BAK is, is really good for protecting against infection, but has an inversely proportional, uh, you know, proportional to the com compatibility of the ocular surface. And we know that patients on multiple medications, especially as uh, Justin Schweitzer pointed out uh, yesterday, will have more ocular surface issues. So this is when I entered the, the patient's care, um, uh, his, his visual acuity was down to 200 and his one, uh, you know, better seeing eye, and he's got a lot of uh, corneal compromise there. And I left this image and there's this super, you know, light sensitive, is, uh, but you can see there that there's a lot of uh, epithelial disruption. So this is a patient that I uh, started on uh, autologous serum, 
uh, and a compounded medication called Predhelon, which is a diluted uh, a steroid eye drop. Um, and, um, and, you know, this case really highlights that some of our patients, despite, you know, he was kind of lost to follow up. He hadn't been back in many years, but had a, what I think was, was a, a reaction to a, uh, it was a substitution problem. Basically he'd been on FML for a long time. And for some reason, his insurance company didn't want to pay for it anymore. And we um, made a big mistake in okay to medication that we had in our chart as being one that he had a problem with in the past. But I just wanted to, you know, kind of share this case with you guys and, and just kind of see where you're at with some of these patients that um, we know have comorbid disease. And again, the, the innovative uh, part of this is that we have some patients that need um, in office treatments and they need steroids and they need, uh, you know, um, these um, immunomodulator type uh, medications. And there's an, another bucket of patients that in addition to those things really can benefit from some of these compounded medications like Atelibus serum and some of the things that you see listed here. Um, you know, Derek, what are, what are, where would you go? I mean, what, what kind of patient usually fits into that um, you know, treatment regimen where you're kind of trying to pull some of these tools out of your toolbox? Yeah, some hard lessons that I think we've learned with glaucoma is that two things. I'm going to minimize the amount of drops they have to use because I do not want to affect the compliance of the glaucoma medication. So we'll use a lot of SLTs, MIGs, or, uh, you know, uh, in-office therapy so they don't have to do stuff at home. And the second thing is understanding that all glaucoma patients are going to eventually have significant dry eye. And the earlier you treat it, the better off you are. So th that'd be the big thing for me is, is trying to move this patient away from as many drops as possible. Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, do you have any uh, anything you want to throw out there on this one? Yeah, I know we're trying to wrap up, so I'll keep it quick. Uh, just, um, you know, I, you know, OSD and glaucoma is one of my, my babies. <laughs> we need yeah. to absolutely pay attention to the ocular surface and as much as possible decrease uh, BAK. Um, I will say I noticed that the patient was on Repressa, which actually has the least amount of BAK um, from the glaucoma med. So if, if you have to use one, that's a good one to keep in mind. Um, and then the other point I would make is that there are a lot of compounded medications are fantastic, especially to get some things preservative free. There's some new preservative free things coming in the market from um, TIA from Europe. So that's something to watch out for as well. And that there are alternatives that we can do now for the treatment of glaucoma that are longer lasting, like a Darista, um, like an SLT. And so I would also be aware and cognizant that maybe there is um, that there should be a suggestion to um, see the glaucoma doc again or, or to have a change in treatment so that you preserve the surface. Awesome. Um, well, I, uh, I, I want to thank you guys uh, very much. I had a, um, a, a slide in here earlier where there's an image of, of uh, some kids that they're called the investigators. <laughs> my, my daughters, I have four little daughters that are like enamored with this uh, Netflix series. And I find myself watching that way too much with them. And, and I think, man, these, these little kids are really good case history takers. Um, Is that their shirt behind you on the wall? <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> That's Liverpool behind me there. So, nobody knows what that is. So, uh, I want to thank you guys so much. This has been really fun. And I learned a great deal from you guys. Um, looking forward to collaborating with you guys more and more. And, uh, and have a great night. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Bye.